Thank you very much, and a very good evening. The time of your life is November 1941. It's two years into the war, and for our nation, it is a low point. These women are defying a Ministry of War directive in order to protect their country. Marguerite Patton is bolstering the nation's defences with carrots, and Florence Desmond is doing her bit with apple sauce. And a young lady from the East End of London is making her own contribution to the war effort. She is boosting morale, she's bringing us all much closer together, and she's carving her own place in history. It's 9.30 on a Sunday evening, the 9th day of November, and a brand new radio series is about to take to the air. men in uniform from the girls at home. <laughs> a personal letter in words and music and the signature is Sincerely yours, Vera Lynn. Ladies and gentlemen, Dame Vera Lynn. Obviously, 1941 was a very important time for you because yes, uh, you were appearing on the West End stage and you yes, got married that year. I did. But why have you latched on to November as being the time of your life? It was um, a very important turn in my career, I think, because it was from this program that I reached so many people in so many different countries. I mean, it, mm. um, apart from the, the people at home, uh, the program went out to all the boys that were serving overseas and they would pick the program up in the desert or all sorts of places they were in and also on the, uh, along the continent. It was very important, that apparently, that program mm. because they thought, well, while the program was going out, London was still standing and uh, they say it gave them hope and encouragement and it meant a great deal to them. Well, we're going to obviously build a little tapestry around November 1941. Yes. In fact, everything that you see by way of the stories we're going to present in the next half an hour all come from that month. And let's try and create some of the mood of what was going on in the UK by showing you a quite extraordinary piece of film and quite extraordinary song. It's kind of sort of sing along a battle. Have a look at this. <laughs> What's particularly extraordinary about that is that that song was shown after the cinema news. And you can't really imagine something like that going out these days. Well, two years into the war, women were, of course, playing their own very vital role. Although in one particular area, their efforts were being resisted. In spite of the official ban on anything like a woman's home guard, many women are determined to carry on with drill and, if possible, to acquire a knowledge of how to fire a rifle. In some parts of the country, factory workers formed their own units and put themselves into uniform. But I gather that this is received with fierce official frown. Of course, women have been grim fighters ever since Berdasir first swung a battle axe. But seriously, they're dead keen on learning to handle a rifle, and it does show a grand spirit. Mrs. Crosswell, you were part of the Slough Women's Army, weren't you? Yes. How successful were you as a shot? Oh, very good. Uh, the lieutenant uh, of the uh, uh, drill hall wanted me to become perfect shot. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, in the drill hall, if I lie down on the mat, will you lie across my body? And that will give you a steadier aim, which I did. And I got a bullseye. It was very I'm intimate for those days, wasn't it? That kind of thing. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I bet you didn't know that to your husband. I did tell him how. <laughs> I just showed him the target, you see. <laughs> Yeah. Ursula, what, what were you doing at this time? Well, we also were... Uh, it was thought that the women in Milford on Sea should learn to shoot with rifles, but we didn't lie across anybody's body. 
No, of we, course not. We, Jealous. We were doing this. They were very, very heavy rifles. Mm. And it was quite obvious that if we had bullets in and we shot, we would get each other's feet because we couldn't even hold them up. They were down there. And so that was given up. We're sort of making light of it, but it was obviously a very, very serious effort. I mean, there was a very real thought that Absolutely. Britain was going to be invaded. It was very, very serious. We were, really. Do you think you'd have been pretty good down at Milford when, well, we were when it came to it? Well, we were highly organised in as much as we had to remove all our bathing huts on the beach so that, they, that the soldiers would have a, a view of the Solent. And um, we had to move our bathing huts, and we put ours in our dining room to shore it up as an air raid shelter. And as it had a flat roof, it was thought we could have a Sten gun on top of the roof. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you very much indeed for that story from 1941. And we're looking at November 1941 and a broadcasting milestone with the first edition of a new programme, Sincerely Yours. Dear boys, I've been working in the West End all this week and using the tubes and buses a lot. I realised how well some of the girls are doing your job while you're away. Was that really <laughs> true? Mm. Oh, yes. I used to like to um, uh, tell the boys what was happening and um, give them messages from home. And also I would uh, pay a visit or two to hospitals where Sergeant Jones' wife would be giving birth to a child, and I would give him the message over the radio and tell him he was the daddy. Well, as I said at the beginning of the programme, of course, you had these other projects, uh, sizable projects underway in the West End, and you were appearing with Florence Desmond in Apple Sauce. Yes, it was. Well, because we, we opened the show originally in the Hoban Empire, but that got a direct hit and uh, put it all out of work for a while. Yeah, and then what all happened around? if there was an air raid? Right oh, every night there was an air raid. When the show was over, we would... Uh, they wouldn't want to go out onto the streets while the bombs were falling, so we'd so stay behind songs. and have a sing song <laughs> and a yeah. knees up on the stage. And then, w w when they gradually filtered away off home, and uh, Desi wasn't too bad because she lived near the West End, so she didn't have too far to go. But I lived in, at uh, at Barking, which was right through <laughs> Bomb Alley, mm. and I I was driving a little. Uh, Austin 10 with a canvas roof top, so I used to have to drive along with a tin hat on, <laughs> and uh, because of the shrapnel coming through. What was Vera like in those? Um, what was she like? In difficult times <laughs> on the West End stage. Oh, she was a very young, naive girl. De Desi guided me in an awful lot of things. First of all, she said, uh, "I think you need a new dress. I don't think you, you know." You um, need a new one. Uh, th that's not cool. suitable for you, so she, she took me to her dressmaker, and I know it took my whole year's coupons. Uh, yeah, you couldn't coupons. buy a pair of stockings after that. No, th no, not a thing. 30 but it was worth it. For one dress. But it was worth Vera, I can see now, it was pink. Right, organza. Yes, and Lots you had sleeves. big shoulders. Oh, yes, the Big falsies. sleeves all in here. Yeah. And your tiny waist. Oh, they put I'm a couple tiny. of falsers here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> And it was yards of it. Is it true that you saw in Vera a potential of the of the magnitude of Gracie Fields? Oh yes. I said, you're it. Grace is away. You are right for the part. You're one of the people. You can talk to them. And you you are it. And it was a very funny thing that uh, my doctor um, uh, then uh, John Peel, Mr. Peel, he was and. It was my gynaecologist, and uh, the women used to go to John Peel and say, Look, Mr. Peel, do you think you could bring the baby on just a couple of weeks earlier so that I can tell Vera Lynn that the baby's come? My husband's serving overseas, you know, he's in the uh, Mediterranean. He'd be so That's pleased not if you could true, only tell him. He said, Honestly, I've never had any like it. He said, Were you aware of that sort of interest in the program? Well, yes, it, it was amazing, yes. really. Yes. Well, as we know, you were a very important part of that period, and um, with the war on, there were all sorts of rather strange effects on us. In the woman magazine, there was a pattern for you to knit your own cami knickers. <laughs> you think that's funny, just have a look at this next thing that appeared in the Sunday Dispatch. Of course, at this time, people had to practice wearing their gas masks, and they used to do that in some pretty extraordinary places as well. For example, in the lift, 
or whilst conducting orchestras, <laughs> or at the ballet school. <laughs> Fairly predictably, most things were in short supply. You may have weapons of war in your own attic. Don't mind the dust, bring them down. The old mower won't mow lawns anymore, but it will help you to mow down your enemies. We want to hit them with everything, including the kitchen stove. Old bedsteads are needed to put the Nazis to sleep. A sleep where they'll dream no more dreams of conquest. And talking of Jerry's... <laughs> it's not a very large Christmas tree. There's no demand in England for large trees this year. They wouldn't fit into the shelters or into the basements and cellars with their low ceilings. This year, England celebrates Christmas underground. Well, I imagine that's tugged at a few heartstrings, and it really is impossible for people who haven't lived through that particular period to know what it was like. Can you imagine that in 1941, Boxing Day was cancelled, and postcards for Christmas were made illegal? It really was uh, an amazing time. The only thing there seemed to be a lot of were carrots. They were everywhere. There was a total glut of carrots in November 1941. And the Ministry of Food suggested all sorts of things to do with them, including turning them into jam. They asked Walt Disney to draw a carrot family to make carrots more popular. And there were other quite interesting things that you could do with carrots, as this lady was telling us in November 1941. And now let me show you some of my favourite ways with carrots. We're going to start the meal off in grand style with cheese and carrot hors d'oeuvre. Your ration of cheese for one person goes a long, long way if you grate it finely with finely grated carrots, a tiny knob of margarine, a little mustard, a little vinegar to give it um, flavour, spread on bread or toast, have it either toasted or as a soft topping, jolly good and fill everyone up beautifully. Do you know the thing we sometimes forget about carrots is they are so versatile. And if you've forgotten what an apricot tastes like, let me remind you. But remind you, by cooking carrots until they're soft, not flavouring them with sugar, they're lovely and sweet, but adding a little plum jam. Now, I'm sure you've made plum jam with the fruit. And strangely enough, with a little lemon essence, that is very like an apricot filling in the tart. And if you'd like my recipes for carrot jam, either mixed with fruit or by itself, well, you only have to ask. Now, there we are, on the kitchen front. Come on, let's show them that, like every other front, we're doing our best, and we're jolly well doing very well. That was marvellous. It really was like that, was it? Oh, it was just like that. You see, I wasn't letting anybody be sorry for themselves. I wouldn't have sympathised with you, because you hadn't got meat and you hadn't got that. I'd have just chivied you along yes. so that you felt you were living on the fat of the land. I mean, did people take you seriously when you came up with a fish head? I mean, but they had to take us seriously. Oh um, the fish head, we were terribly grand. Um, that recalled a recipe for mock oyster soup. Now, yes. that sounds very tempting, doesn't it? It does, indeed. And um, we poached either slices of new potato or the little knobbly Jerusalem artichokes, and there was our oyster. Mm. And the cakes, do you know, I'm still asked for the cake recipes, um, an eggless uh, fruit cake. And the secret of that, it wasn't a secret weapon. It was a secret for a jolly good cake. What's that? I wouldn't like to say, to be honest. No, it's tea. <laughs> and you boil the fat and the sugar and the fruit in tea. Yeah. And don't ask me why, but it became a jolly good cake. 
and a one-egg sponge. But, oh, let me just show you my pièce de résistance, which I remember making often, um, parsley honey. Oh, that sounds interesting. That, that doesn't turn me over quite as much as the carrot jam. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, Lee, for recreating this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Marguerite Patton. Thank you. Well, a gentleman who you probably know a little met, bit about. Yes, yes we've met yes. before. Harry Lewis. Mm. Uh, Mr. Vera Lynn, really, I suppose, in some respects. <laughs> yes. After 42 mind. years, I don't mind. <laughs> 45 what, years. What about when you met? You were both uh, with, with Ambrose at that time, That's right. You? That's right. I wrote her on chewing gum, actually. Yes, he used to offer me chewing gum, I think. I'd, where at he rehearsals. got it from, it, uh, I don't know how it... Harry got it because uh, chewing gum was rationed, wasn't it, in those days? But he did. He used to offer me chewing gum. I hated chewing gum, and I still do, but I, I took it. One yes. thing I'm particularly interested in, Harry, how have you felt over the years sharing Vera? Because she has become so much part, because of the war involvement, so much part of the British way of life. I don't really share her, you know. I know that all these millions of people are crazy about her, but when we go home at night, she goes home with me. Does it ever frustrate you that people seem to keep harking back to the, the 40s period of your career? But, well, but it, of course, has gone on and been so successful. I mean, you were the first British artist to have a number one in America, weren't you, in 1952? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's been a bit difficult in a way, but, of course, in another way, it's made it much easier for me. I never get stuck for, for songs to, to make a programme up. Mm. But, of course, it has been very difficult to get people to accept me singing modern songs. Yes. Well, you're going to hate me for this, but we've got to show a clip from the film where you're singing what for many millions of people in this country is that special virulent song. We'll meet again Don't know when Don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day Just like you, always do, till the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away. And I will tell you how, to the cross I will tell you how we will be long. They'll be happy to know. I'm lucky, I'm able to say I was born after the war. That still gives me prickles. Does it still do things for you, that song? Yeah, you know, it's amazing. That the, uh, I get a lot of young people at my concerts, and uh, we say, I don't know why, but it just gives them tingles. Yes. Well, that yes. was very much an anthem for the armed forces, mm. wasn't it? And you've retained that association with uh, your interpretation of sailing. They, uh, they took the uh, sailing as their theme song. Yeah. yeah it shouldn't is. be forgotten that in fact November 1941 was a real low point for this country's fortunes in the war. Most of Europe had been overrun by the Nazis or Nazi sympathizers and it looked as if Moscow might fall. The fighting was mostly in the desert and on the Russian front. But fortunately we were still able to every now and again laugh at the Germans. <laughs> a period for the odd incredible story on the battlefield a wounded soldier hung helplessly over the shoulder of another man private Clifford Rollings struggled through shellfire and bursting bombs carrying his human load 
Hiding in shell holes and bushes, he kept the wounded man alive while he dodged the enemy. But just as he was about to make a last dash to safety, he too collapsed and both men were captured. The wounded man was Private James Ripley. Neither knew each other. It was their first meeting. James, after that first meeting, you found that in fact uh, there was a link between you. Definitely. We exchanged addresses, or more or less, you know, verbally. He said, where do you come from? I said, just out of Brighton, Burgess Hill, actually. I think it was that. Anyway, I pulled a photograph out. I said, there's my girlfriend. And he looked at it. And it happened to be his sister. And I'd never seen them before. Never seen him. What an incredible coincidence. <laughs> yeah. But you would remember that particular incident in the war with... Um, well, I don't know whether you'd say affection, but I mean, it must be quite one of the most incredible escapes from a bullet. I think so. Uh, would you like to tell us that part of the saga? Well, do you want to see it? Yes, please. Look, there's the paybook. You had a paybook in your pocket? That, I beg your pardon. Paybook and there's my notebook, both the but same bullet through, <laughs> if it's interesting. And there's a watch. And that watch was in your pocket? Yeah, in this one. Yeah. And it went in and ricocheted out through. And ruined your watch. <laughs> well, it stopped it. Yeah. <laughs> Would I be right in saying that that was the time of your life? Definitely, the time <laughs> of my life. As the gent said, a stopwatch. <laughs> yes, indeed, all oh, very good. Thank you, James. Thank I'm you. pleased that we found you. We're looking at Thank November you. 1941. This letter of mine is getting to be a sort of rendezvous where husbands and wives, torn apart by war, can be brought together by music. On the wings of these melodies, the sentiments go from me to both of you, from you to her. Here is our song together tonight. Night and day, you are... Howard Thomas, at that point of the war, 1941, you were working for the BBC. And did, was it your idea, this programme, Sincerely Yours? Yes, indeed it was. I really wanted to have a link between the men and their women. And the, the, the great theme of this programme was I'm a girl back home, I'm speaking for you and your wife, to you and your wife, and she really was a link. I saw the qualities she had of believing in the song she sang, of sincerity. Mm. Mm. You didn't have it all your own way, though, if you were honest. The, there were people in the BBC who didn't really like what you were doing. Well, no, it was a bit strange to the BBC. It was a very commercial programme. And up top, as we saw from the minutes, eventually, they did say some rude things about it. I think one, one minute said, uh, deplorable, but obviously very popular. <laughs> Too sentimental, they said. It would make the boys homesick. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, the reaction that I've had since the war, it, it really did do what Howard wanted it to do. And it certainly didn't make them homesick. It gave them courage, they said, and gave them hope uh, that they would go back home. A programme which was dubbed by some of your colleagues as sort of Howe's obstetrics programme or something. Well, that's that? right, because this idea of the baby being born, uh, after all, any news from home, what is the best news? The best news of the arrival of a child. Mm. And it was picked up by Fleet Street. We, we can show here the way in which the newspapers handled that particular element of Sincerely Yours. To Rifleman Ryder, a daughter. I shall send your wife some flowers, said Vera Lynn, when during her Sincerely Yours program broadcast on Sunday, she told Rifleman Norman Ryder that his wife had presented him with a daughter. So here you are, Rifleman Ryder, the first picture of your wife with your baby daughter. A lovely touch, and we've got a little surprise for you. If you'd like to come over here, we have got uh, Rifleman Ryder. You haven't. Norman, and well. uh, his wife Doris. And Where the little baby that was mentioned. Hello. Oh, you're lovely. joking. How nice. Lovely. Now, you, you well, are now oh, Vera Lynn, aren't yes. you? Yeah, that'd be really Vera yes. Lynn, Doris Ryder. Isn't that amazing? And what was it, what was it like when, when Vera Lynn's programme featured your, your newborn baby? She was born in the hospital, and then from the hospital we was taken down to the air raid shelters. Mm. So I was lying in the air raid shelter when... The sister of the hospital came out, put the radio, the radio at the side mm. of me, and she said, listen to this. And I 
no time to warn anybody that it was going over the air. I think it's lovely. I think it's a lovely story. And I think it's so nice we've been able to bring you all together. Yes, you too. Well, unfortunately, we're just about out of time, unfortunately. But um, as I mentioned earlier, you have created another anthem in many respects with sailing. And you're going to sing well, it for I, us I, now. Well, I sing it now on my concerts, uh, to, uh, because I dedicate it to the boys, because mm. they chose it as their theme right. song. Well, Sailing. would you like to go over Do that it? way? Right. And we would love to love play out of this program. You too. You'll have a chance to have a further chat afterwards, right. I'm sure. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for on this edition of Time of Your Life. I hope you'll join me at the same time next week when somebody else will be having a rather special occasion with hopefully a few more rather special memories. Ladies and gentlemen, for this week, Dame Vera Lynn. To be with you, to 